Uh, okay, I'm Anders, uh, and the topic for today's talk is going to be the compliance business case for Kubernetes in the EU. Get ready for the EU CS. And uh, unfortunately, my friend Robert could not make it here today, which is unfortunate given that he's really the one who knows anything about the EU CS, but I'll do my best. Uh, so I'm Anders, I work as a developer advocate at Styra which is the creators and the maintainers of the Open Policy Agent project. And uh, yeah, if, if you want to reach out later for questions, I'm, I'm available at most of these services. Just find me by my first and last name. So to start with the EUCS, uh, the EUCS or really the European Cyber Security Certification Scheme, which is a, a long name, uh, comes out of the Article 48.2, the Cybersecurity Act, which was uh, drafted by ENISA. It, it's currently in a draft mode, so it's not enforced yet, or it's not, it's not out there yet. But, uh, it's available for review and so on. Uh, what the EUCS uh, provides is basically a reference set with a whole bunch of, of security requirements. Uh, these are rather high level, so they don't mention things like Kubernetes or OPA or uh, any, anything like that. But uh, a whole bunch of, of requirements that you need to uh, fulfill for certification. Um, most of these requirements are based on, on, upon previous standards and national schemes like uh, ISO and IEC 270XX, a C5 standard in, uh, from Germany and a SecNAM cloud from France. Uh, this certification scheme will apply to any cloud service provider. So it's, it's not just for like uh, those who actually provide the cloud, but anyone acting in the cloud. So this includes uh, infrastructure as, serv as a service, uh, platforms as a service, software as a service. So it's basically most of us. These requirements are grouped into 19 different categories. Uh, and each of these diff categories is divided into a number of themes. Uh, if you do get certified, you get certified for three years across the whole EU. And uh, uh, one reason I think like this is gonna apply to most of us is the certification is, is viral, if you so will, uh, in, the, in the same sense as software licenses can be. Because uh, if any vendor wants to to apply for a certification, it will also be uh, all the sub-vendors or sub-contractors, sub-processors will also be included in the assessment. And if they are not certified, that's going to be uh, it's going to be tough. So, so it's basically will apply to to most of us, I think. So, the cloud service provider, the way it works, uh, the cloud service provider takes these requirements and does a self-assessment. And that assessment is later reviewed by an accredited auditor. There are three basic levels or assurance levels for certification. And I think most, uh, most companies are probably gonna be either basic or substantial, while the high level is for finance, uh, government, and so on. So for the basic level, you need to minimize the known basic risks uh, of incidents and cyber attacks, meaning a low risk profile. It's a limited assurance, uh, self-assessment, but it is reviewed by a third party and focuses on definition and existence of procedures and mechanisms. So for the substantial level, and I think a lot of us are going to, to aim for that level, it means you, we need to minimize known cybersecurity risks and risk of incidents. So it's not just basic risk anymore, but a medium risk profile. And we can see as we move further to the right, what things are starting. Uh, one requirement that starts to appear is like this automation. So we, we now have a, a requirement to do functional testing. We can't just check things off uh, boxes anymore, but we need to actually verify this. And at the high level, we minimize the risk of state-of-the-art cyber attacks carried out by actors with significant skills and resources, an elevated risk profile. And again, 
in the bottom there, continuous automated monitoring on compliance. So it's not, you can't just assess this, get a certification for the next three years, and then come back three years later, but this needs to be an automated process, and the assessment needs to be done continuously. All right, so what does it look like? Here's an example of an EUCS control. And when we say control, that's basically another word for requirement in this context. So a requirement or a control might look something like this. And this is the IM05 regular review of access rights, which has the objective that the fitness for purpose of the user accounts of all types under associated access rights are reviewed regularly. Makes sense? So for, uh, basic, for the basic assurance level, we have one requirement. The CSP shall review the access rights of all the user accounts under its responsibility, at least once a year to ensure that they still respond to the, cars, to the current needs. So that seems easy enough. For a substantial level, the review defined in IM051 shall be performed by authorized persons under the responsibility of an authorized body that has approved the access right policies. Uh, and so on. And for each of these steps, the requirements are yet more fine-grained, more detailed, and obviously uh, will require more to, to pass. Uh, mentioning in passing here, uh, one actor which uh, does a, a lo lot of good in this space is Medina, or Medina. It's an EU-funded research project which has the goal to create a security framework for actually achieving these things that the, the, the EUCS talks about, which is continuous audit-based certification in compliance with the EU-wide cloud security certification scheme. So the EUCS provides uh, the requirements and, and a, a, a big document stating what you need to do, or, while Medina provides uh, actual tools and processes and techniques to, to to, to maintain compliance or to achieve compliance. So if the UCS is, is the more abstract thing, this is more concrete. So that's a useful resource to, to check out if you're interested. All right, so that was a quick introduction to the UCS. Moving on to uh, the open policy agent. What is that and what does it have to do with the UCS? So OPA is a general purpose policy engine. How many here have used OPA? Oh, there's a lot. A lot of you have used OPA, so that's good. But for those who haven't, uh, OPA is a general purpose policy engine. And of course, we, we're talking policy again here. EUCS, obviously another policy. And, and now we're talking about a policy engine. Uh, and a policy is, is basically a bunch of rules. And a policy engine is basically somewhere you, you put those rules and then you can query that engine, provided some input, uh, given that I have this or that, uh, is this resource compliant? Or should this user be allowed to do this or that? That's a policy engine. It's a graduated CNCF project uh, since two years back. What OPA does, it provides a unified framework for working with policy as code across all layers of the stack. And we will see why that is important when we talk about something like the EUCS. Again, the EUCS doesn't mention any specific technologies. So how you choose to, to implement that is gonna be up to you. But OPA uh, works really well for a holistic framework uh, like the EUCS. A key concept of OPA is that we want to decouple policy from application logic. Uh, how we used to, to work with policy is basically we, we had a, a couple of if else statements inside of our source code. We said, if this or this is found in the input, send this back to the user. Uh, what we do with OPA is basically we try and decouple those rules so we can uh, reason about them separately, we can test them independently from our applications, and so on. So we, we basically make policy a first class concept. Policies of OPA, they're written in a declarative uh, language called Rego. We'll look at, uh, a bit more into that in a bit. So OPA is an open source project. Again, it has a, a, a big community, over 350 contributors, uh, over 100 integrations. 
spanning all types of uh, technologies. 8,000 GitHub stars, 7,000 Slack users, uh, and a, a bunch of sub-projects and or related projects like OPA Gatekeeper, Contest, Editor plugins for IntelliJ, uh, and, and uh, Visual Code, and so on. So use cases, we, we talked about OPA as an, a holistic uh, tool, and EUCS is in a holistic framework. So, uh, which, is, which is, of course, a benefit when you, when you try and apply a framework like the EUCS across the whole, your whole stack. Uh, so whether you work with application authorization, whether it's infrastructure or container orchestration, whether it's cloud vendors, whether it's uh, GitOps, CICD, or data sources, uh, there is likely going to be an integration where you can, uh, where you can uh, have OPA, Again, decouple these type of policy questions where you can work with policy independently. And of course, all of, pretty much all of these technologies, they already have some way of, of working with policy. Uh, so OPA did not invent that concept. The problem is, of course, if you have uh, so many different ways of working with policy, how do you manage that at scale across a large organization? Okay, so if OPA can work with so many services, how does that work? If you ever ever been to an OPA presentation before, I think you've probably seen this. It's, it's one that is commonly included. The way it works, we have a service and we have a request. And when we say service, that can mean a lot of things. It could be a microservice application. It could be a Kafka broker. It could be... Uh, the Kubernetes API server and so on. So basically anything servicing a request takes that request and rather than making a decision on its own, it sends a policy query over to OPA. Should this user be allowed? Should this resource be deployable? Or, and so on. So OPA based on policy and uh, optionally data uh, considers the input it got from the query and returns a response or a decision. Both the inputs and the outputs are uh, JSON formatted. So basically any, anything that can handle JSON, which is probably most software components from the last 20 years or so, can work with OPA. And uh, a simplified example here, we have some input, we have a, a, a little piece of JSON, we, we have a user, we have an, a, a name for the user, and we have a couple of, of roles. The Rego policy here in the middle, it basically just says by, that by default, any request should be, the allow rule should be false. So we should not allow anyone by default. But allow should be true if there is an admin role in the input user roles. And in this case, there is no admin role in the input, so the decision is false. So that's basically uh, a very simplified way of uh, how OPA works and how Rego works. Okay, so, so back to the EUCS then. Can we translate that type of policy to policy as code? Because that's really what we all want to work with. Uh, and if you, if you check the EUCS, PDF, and of course, that's a PDF, it's not really code. Uh, what you really wanna go to, it's the Annex A. That's where you'll find all these requirements with their assurance levels. 19 categories again, uh, organization of information security, information security policies, risk and asset management, operational security, identity authentication and access control, development of information systems. And if you ever work with OPA, this seems like a, a pretty good fit. We do most of these things in OPA. And again, remember a central theme here is continuous automated monitoring. Can't really do that by looking at the PDF file, comparing that to the real world. We need automation, and we need automated processes. So the ECS's policy, can it be codified? And before we, like, can we, can we, can we uh, find some way to codify the EUCS itself? We could, of course, try and translate that to Rego directly, but that would be rather hard. 
without, since the UCS is not like technology specific, there is an interesting format uh, that I think is interesting, which is called OSCAL, which is recommended uh, for inclusion in, uh, in the UCS, but we'll see. It's uh, from NIST, the American uh, actor, uh, which means Open Security Control Assessment Language. So it, ma it basically means compliance as code. And uh, it's not really code, it's YAML, JSON, or XML, whichever you prefer. But, rather, uh, but we're at least moving in the right direction because we're moving away from a PDF file to some sort of structured data, a schema, where we describe these rules. Uh, and the rules themselves are just one part of OSCO. Uh, that, because OSCO uh, co composes of three different layers or schemas. The control layer, this is, that's what we've been looking at so far. That's the requirement. The next schema type is the implementation, where you describe how did you uh, go on about being compliant? How did you solve this problem? What components uh, did you include in that solution? And the next layer or schema is the assessment layer. How do we assess that we are compliant with this standard? And assessment layer also includes an assessment result format. So if you have automated testing and so on, you can output an assessment result, which will tell you, yes, we are compliant or we are not. So no more PDFs. We want to automate everything. We want to be able to exchange these requirements, implementations and assessments across our different systems. And of course, as you saw with OPA, OPA is JSON in, JSON out. So this works really well with OSCAL, it turns out, because we can use OPA and Rego to do things like policy on policy enforcement, where we actually check if, you, if your assessment uh, or if your implementation says that you've, you've solved, uh, I don't know, uh, what should we say? If you saw like cryptography in transit or TLS, but OPA can see that you you have not specified any components here, which actually uh, fulfills that requirement. That would be a policy violation. So if OSCIL describes the actual uh, uh, the actual policy, we can use OPA to enforce that. And you can do a whole lot of other interesting things with uh, OSCIL and Rego. You can use OSCIL to build uh, Rego rules. So try and translate these requirements into actual Rego. And you can use OPA to generate OSCIL artifacts as well. And now we're getting closer to our goal of continuous compliance. So an example here would be asset management. And this is of course like asset classification and labeling. I think most of you who worked with like a policy engine, this is, this is a, a basic thing for you. We, most of us have required that any resource must have a label or it must have some uh, metadata attached to it. This is also a requirement of the EUCS. The CSP shall define an asset classification schema that reflects for each asset the protection needs of information it possesses, stores, and, or transmits. So let's move into something real, or at least resembling something real. So the first one was we need an asset classification schema. An asset classification schema shall provide levels of protection for the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and authenticity protection objectives. So a very basic schema for asset classification might look like this. We have one attribute for availability, we have one for confidentiality. The next requirement, when applicable, the CSP shall label assets according to the classification in the assets classification scheme. So we need, to, we need to ensure that all our assets are labeled. And if we were to do that, I'm gonna hop in here, make it a bit bigger. Uh, we can see here, the first thing we can note uh, is our asset classification schema. For admission control, we have something that's about to be deployed. We have a pod in this case. It does have a couple of labels. 
And we do have a policy uh, which has uh, two rules, one that requires all these labels to be present. The next rule, which requires the values to be valid. So you can't just make uh, any, valid, uh, any value up. It must be one of those defined by our asset schema. So if we are to evaluate uh, the report here, we will see that in this case, we have an invalid uh, value for uh, the availability classification. There's no medium of availability. It was either low, high, or critical. And we are missing a required label, uh, which is confidentiality. So a basic example of, of policy enforcement directly taken from the EUCS. If I were to do something like the same rule or the same policy applied to cloud formation, which is of course an entirely different uh, technology. And if I hop between these two, uh, the, thing, the thing that we might notice here is the input data here between these two, it changes course, but that's basically all that changes. Uh, the one line that changes is up on number five, where in the case of admission control, we can just go right to the labels. Uh, in the case of, of cloud formation, we need to transform those into a set because I think they're provided uh, as a list of objects. Showing the value of OPA and Rego and having a unified way of doing this, we can change one line of code to, to reuse the same policy for an entirely different technology. So this is part of, of the value of having a unified framework and a tool to work with policy. So the last one for substantial assurance level, it's the need for protection shall be determined by the individuals or groups responsible for the assets. So a bit contrived example here, but what we're doing here, we, we imagine we're, that we're in, uh, in a pull request flow. In that pull request flow, we're gonna do a curl request to the GitHub uh, API. We're gonna see that the user making this change is, in this case, it's Anders. We're gonna do a mapping. We're gonna see uh, for each of these teams who are the members. And a simple policy to describe that allow, we should allow this deployment if the input PR username is in the data teams labels, uh, label owner members meaning we match, we match the label uh, provided with the actual owner of this resource. And if I'm not the owner of this resource, I should not be allowed to make modifications. So again, an entirely different technology, GitHub in this uh, case, uh, doesn't really matter. JSON in, it's JSON out. As long as we have that, we can work with OPA. So that's, uh, that's Rego, it's, it's OPA on, on the more kind of distributed, low level side of things. But another important aspect of OPA, and especially in this context, is its management capabilities. Because when you deploy OPA, uh, you, again, it's a, you, you probably want it in as, much, in as many places as possible, because it solves a whole bunch of different problems. So OPA is a distributed component, and if you, if you go to any large uh, enterprise or organization, you, you might find hundreds or even thousands of OPAs. So in order to manage that, you'll need centralized control. So OPA provides a number of APIs. One of them is the bundle API, which allows uh, distributed distribution from a, as of policy and data from a centralized location. Decision logging, we'd wanna know what all these decisions OPA made, we wanna know what what they said. That too we want in a centralized location. We want a centralized configuration, we want a centralized status and health reports. The less places we have to look, the, le the simpler uh, the auditing. So this model we covered already, that's the distributed part of OPA. The centralized one works something like this. You have uh, a policy repo uh, where, you, where you carry your policy, uh, optionally, uh, any other data you might need. And you have a number of data sources. 
could be things like permissions, user databases, or whatnot. And you take whatever data is relevant for your use case, and you package that up into a bundle. And the bundle is basically just a tarball, which OPA goes and fetches periodically. So you get bundle or, and policy and data updates periodically without having to restart your services. So you can work with policy decoupled from your application logic. So bundles provide a unified uh, management and distribution of policy and related data. So the next thing we, we talk about is decision logging. So as OPA pulls down uh, bundles, it also emits a, a whole bunch of decisions. We want those to be somewhere under our control and we want those to be centralized. And of course, uh, these decisions can then in turn be useful for other things like creating an OSCAL assessment report, which is another interesting use case. Access control, it's another uh, big use case for OPA. I think it's, it's probably like 50-50 infrastructure or access control. And uh, access control is, a, is a, an important part of the EUCS as well. So another use case where OPA fits in. There are, uh, taken from the EUCS controls, there's uh, management of access rights, regular review of access rights, privileged access rights, and general access restrictions. And again, with the decoupled model, we get much of this for free. Because if your access controls are scattered over like hundreds of, of different technologies or different services, this is all gonna be a shore. But with OPA, we have one way of centralizing uh, control. So we have centralized management and review of access is made easy by decoupling policy from application logic. And again, we have a unified policy language. So if you know uh, Rego, you can review all of these requirements, regardless of what system it's there to protect. So a few last words on, on access control, because uh, given this is a, a Kubernetes conference, uh, what you can see here is distributed access control. It turns out that distributed authorization is really a challenge. And it's even made, it's made worse in heterogeneous environments where you have one service doing Java, another one doing Python, another one is C, uh, Go, and so on. Uh, because given if we do hard code authorization in these services, it, and we need to make a change, we need to coordinate that change with all these teams. And how do we how do we know that they did the right change? How do I review that? I can't. I don't know all these languages. And so it requires collaboration, and it's really hard to audit. And and how, where is it logged? Where do, where does the, those logs end up? So again, we introduce OPA. We have one way of dealing of managing policy, and one one way to enforce policy across our whole stack, regardless of other technology choices. And we see the control plane here providing policies, permission, and whatever else is needed for authorization. And this is exactly what we want in, in this context. We need, we need as few places as possible for, uh, for auditing and for management provisioning of policy. So before we uh, wrap up, a few, a few extra since we're in a Kubernetes conference, a few examples here of, 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 of Rego or OPA policy or EUCS policy translated into Rego. And uh, we're not gonna go into the actual Rego here, but just a few examples here. When, when the control says you need to maintain an, a list of exceptions. Uh, so if you, have, if you have a need to do exceptions from your security policy, that those exceptions must be documented and maintained. Of course, that's very easy to validate in, in Rego. That's just that's basically just extra data that you provide uh, an allow list or so to your policy. These exceptions need to be limited in time. So we could, uh, for example, schedule a check of the creation timestamp of the resource against the time limit for any resource marked for exception. Uh, we should, the CSP shall perform a risk assessment to assess and, and treat the risks on any project. 
So we could do something like an allow deny based on labels. Just we, if we can uh, assume some other system would label uh, our components based on risk. Or we can actually calculate a risk in a more advanced policy and, uh, and determine whether we should allow that to be deployed or not. And so on. So if, you, if you're interested in these examples, just check them out. Uh, it should be noted, though, uh, again, the EUCS is, an, is a holistic framework, so it covers a whole bunch of things, and it, not all of these things are even tech. Uh, so out of these 19 requirements, I'd say about half of them is, uh, are topics where OPA is applicable. Some of these uh, others, like human resources, we can't, do, we can't really write policy for, uh, for people. Uh, or physical security is not really where uh, we tend to work with OPA either. But some of these we're, we could definitely write policy on uh, either way, like cryptography. We don't do cryptography with OPA, but we can, we can write policy that enforces and ensures that uh, any component deployed uh, leverages the right level and, uh, of crypt cryptography and so on. So uh, where OPA is applicable, Organization of information security, information security policies, risk management, asset management, operational security, identity authentication and access control, change in configuration management, development of information systems, and product safety and security. So a whole bunch of, of things where we can use one unified technology to work with policy. All right, so to wrap things up, uh, the UCS, it's a reference set of security requirements. A key here is continuous compliance and automation. That's a key to certification. And, and the more, the further you go on, this, on these assurance levels, the more automation you will need, the more continuous compliance. You need to, it's, while the certification uh, is over three years, it's not good enough to just say, okay, we, we, we had an auditor here three years ago, so we're compliant. You need, you need to prove that basically at any point in time. The Medina project is a useful resource, so check that out, providing like more hands-on things like tools, techniques, processes for uh, auditing and, and organizations who are in the certification process. Uh, OSCO is an interesting uh, tool for working with these requirements and to kind of treat even requirements and, and how we choose to solve them as code as well. So keyword is, of course, that we want to codify as much as possible. And last, OPA provides a unified way of turning these requirements into enforceable policy across our whole cloud native stack. So if you want to learn more, uh, a couple of links here for, uh, for further research. Uh, EU cybersecurity mini site, the EUCS standard itself, of course. Uh, Eurectib has a, a bunch of good re uh, articles on the topic. It's the Medina project, it's OPA, Rego Playground, and uh, the Styra Academy. And uh, since Robert couldn't be here today, he said uh, if you have any questions on, on, on the more kind of legal aspects of EUCS and so on, because he again is the subject matter expert. You can reach him on uh, either the CNCF Slack or the Kubernetes Slack, or, or just reach out to me and I'll, I'll direct you to him. So that was it, thanks.